Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's Louis from Ideas Matter. It's been quite a while since we last put out a podcast. But I'm happy to announce that I have a number of exciting episodes planned over the next few months. Going forward, I will be interviewing guests about books that they've written, mostly in the fields of political theory, philosophy, and intellectual history. Now, don't worry, these new episodes won't completely replace the standard format where Alex and I discuss a classical text, but they will enable me to release episodes more frequently. And we're off to a great start today. To kickstart this new era of Ideas Matter, I will be interviewing Daniel Bell. Daniel Bell is a Canadian-born political theorist who has lived and worked in mainland China for most of his academic career. I think he's one of the most interesting political theorists alive today. That's because he's prepared to say things that many people aren't. In particular, he violates a major taboo in Western society. He argues that liberal democracy is not the only legitimate way to organise politics. To be clear, Bell isn't against liberal democracy. He's not a member of the post-liberal right. Rather, he argues that our standards of political legitimacy are culturally contingent. In the West, we judge the legitimacy of our government by their ability to win a majority of votes in a free and fair election. No problem with that. In China, however, there is another tradition. Bell calls it Confucian political meritocracy. Political power should go to those who are the most capable and the most virtuous, Virtue here refers to Confucian virtues, particularly the ability to be other-regarding. Elections are not necessarily the best way to select leaders according to these meritocratic standards. In the Chinese context, Confucian political meritocracy is a legitimate alternative to liberal democracy. But don't be fooled. Bell isn't an apologist for the Chinese Communist Party. He acknowledges the many shortcomings of the Chinese government, contemporary China is still a long way from the Confucian ideal. Currently, Daniel Bell is Chair Professor of Political Theory at the University of Hong Kong. Prior to that, he was the Dean of the School of Political Science at Shandong University. He's also been a Professor of Political Theory at Tsinghua University, which is how we first met. Bell supervised my Master's thesis while I was a student at Tsinghua, although COVID prevented us from ever being able to meet in person. Today we're discussing his latest book, The Dean of Shandong, Confessions of a Minor Bureaucrat at a Chinese University. In the book, Bell recounts his time as dean and makes observations about what his experience can tell us about China's broader political system. The book is a mixture of entertaining anecdotes, commentary on contemporary Chinese politics, and insights from ancient Chinese philosophy. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please leave us a rating wherever you happen to listen to us. But without further ado, I give you Daniel Bell. All right, Daniel Bell, thank you so much for joining the podcast. The podcast has been inactive for over a year now, but this is a very, very good way to revive it. Um, We're discussing today your book, The Dean of Shandong. Confessions of a of a minor bureaucrat in in China. I want to ask firstly about your motivations for for writing this book. You've you've written quite a few books on political theory, um, communitarianism and its critics, beyond liberal democracy, and just hierarchy are the ones that that I've read. And so I'm wondering why you decided to write this book specifically in this particular format. So it's a it's a memoir. Why write a a memoir now rather than another ordinary political theory book, I suppose? Well, um, yeah. So first of all, very happy to talk to you. And um, unfortunately, we've never met in person, but we, I look forward to seeing you one day live. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. I mean, to be frank, I, I served as Dean for five years and I feel I wasn't very successful, but I think I did learn some valuable lessons about, Chinese academia with some implications for the Chinese political system. And so it's not so much a memoir, if memoir, if by memoir it means that it's about me, it's more using my own experience as a kind of vehicle to talk about uh, Chinese academia um, and, and the Chinese political system. And I thought to write it in a way that's accessible. And I guess, I guess one might ask, you know, the subject matter is very serious, you know communism, bureaucracy, COVID, 
Uh, but for some reason, I wrote it in a, in a lighthearted way. Why did that? I, I really can't answer that. This must be something wrong with my psychological makeup. But, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it sometimes makes the serious points easier to digest when they're delivered in a less serious manner, I think. Uh, but the significance of the book, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the first non-Chinese person to serve as dean of an academic faculty in a Chinese university. Is that correct? Um, well, it depends. So probably the first who is a non-ethnic Chinese to serve as dean in a faculty of political science at a large public university. Beyond mm -hmm. that, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose the fact that it was political science as well is also right. hugely significant. Right. And you kind of addressed this in your previous answer. One of the motivations, I guess, you, and this is a theme that recurs throughout the book, is you sort of use your experience as dean, as a minor bureaucrat, as, as you say, to not just reflect on Chinese academia, but also to draw out some lessons and reflections on China's political system as a whole. What, what insights do you think serving as a dean... I mean, it's kind of odd. So I guess maybe you should explain that as well, because someone serving at a dean of a Western university wouldn't necessarily claim to have any insight into the Australian political system. Um, so why does serving as a dean of a Chinese university give you some insight into the Chinese political system? Well, a couple of things. I mean, some of the practices that we see at higher levels of government are mirrored um, at lower levels of public administration, like the idea of collective leadership. I mean, I was a bit surprised. I was told before I assumed a deanship that it would be, you know, in Chinese, we say, Yuan Zhang, Shuo Le Suan, like the, whatever the dean wants is basically can be implemented. I realized very quickly that's not the case, that we have to, we have a, a committee with um, several vice deans and party secretaries, and we have to deliberate at length about particular issues and achieve some sort of consensus before moving forward. So I, I didn't know that before I assumed the post. Um, of course, the first chapter is about hair dyeing, which we used to see at higher levels of government, and we also see at lower levels of public administration. To show that this, this, to show that we're very committed to hard work and to serving the community, and that's another thing that I learned, by the way, because I had an earlier book called The China Model, where one of the chapters tried to discuss what are the character traits of successful public officials in the Chinese political system, and I identified three higher level analytical intelligence or superior analytical intelligence, because the issues are very complex, you know, it requires knowledge of e e economics and history and environmental science and so on. Um, superior EQ, because we spend so much time dealing with other people, so we have to understand other people, know how to persuade them, think from other perspectives, as well as superior virtue, just in a sense that a willingness to serve the public as opposed to being corrupt and misusing public resources for one's own gain. But then what I didn't notice, just and I learned this through personal experience, through serving as dean, perhaps the most important trait of all is the capacity for, for hard work. I mean, whatever we think of Chinese public officials, whatever we think of their policies, whether they're right or wrong, what cannot be denied is that they have this tremendous capacity for hard work. And as dean, I had to be on call all the time. We had endless meetings, four hour meetings with, with hardly any breaks. And it was really exhausting. Um, so on the one hand, I had tremendous admiration for my colleagues because of this capacity for hard work, which I only, it's only by serving as dean that I realized that this was so important. And when I started reading more history about successful public officials and Confucians past, I realized it's something that I had missed, you know, but it's quite there. It's there that the really successful ones, not so much because they're great original thinkers, but it's because of partly, if not many, because of this tremendous capacity for hard work, which is still very much required of successful public administrators or public officials in, in the contemporary Chinese political system. Of course, that's one reason why I wasn't also successful because I, as you know, the, the book itself has a lot of self-criticism and one of the major self-criticisms that I just compared to my colleagues, I didn't have this capacity for hard work that they did. I mean, maybe I should be a bit more specific or fair to myself. I, it's hard for me to sit through four hour meetings um, but I don't. I could read a book for four hours, or even sometimes write mm. something for three or four hours. So, the hard the hard work that's required of being a public official is not something that I have compared to my other, to my colleagues. Yeah, it's a different skill, as I think you illustrate in the book. And someone who 
you, I can't remember their name, but someone who you portray as having this skill quite effectively uh, and your impression of the existence of this role seemed to have changed the representative of the communist party um, in, in the faculty. Um, I guess many, many people in the West, particularly now as you know, media is becoming a lot more critical of China. Something that's often pointed out is the fact that the party has representatives inside organizations that wouldn't have any political representatives in the West. And this is true yeah. of academia as well. And you, you talk yeah, about yeah. that role in an interesting way. And I wouldn't say you defend Sorry. it, but you kind of give a cap, a nuanced description of it. Yeah. Let me add one thing. And I don't really mention it in the book, um, but since we're talking about broader political implications, I mean, lots, so I was around in the eighties when people were talking about the lazy official in the Soviet union. And that's one reason why at the times, it did no, very few predicted the sudden collapse of this of the Soviet empire, so to speak. But people were, were saying it's on its last legs. And one of the reasons that public officials were viewed as just going through the motions and being so lazy. And David Shambaugh, you know, the sinologist in the US, wrote a, a piece in the New York, in the Wall Street Journal, where he basically um, kind of predicted the end of the Chinese political system because he says, oh, these are public officials are just so lazy going through the motions. That, my impression is completely the opposite. I mean, whatever goes on at the top, very top, at the mid-level of the bureaucracy, a tremendously hardworking and generally committed public officials. And that's one reason to think that the political system, whatever you think of it, is going to be here for quite a long time um, I, I, compared to what was happening in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Mm, very, very interesting. I guess that's, a cultural difference in a way uh, which emerges out of the Confucian heritage where public service is venerated and is almost viewed as the ideal form of the good life where I suppose in contemporary Western societies you're some if you're intelligent it's almost viewed as a waste of your talents if you go and work in the public sector. Mm -hmm. I get that's one yeah I mean that's a, a way of putting it it's certainly in among academics at leading universities in the West, they would rather be doing their own work compared to serving in the university administration. But in China, typically, even the very, very talented academics would regard as an honor to serve, especially at higher levels of the university administration. And it's even more so in Shandong province. I think the Confucian influence is strong. It's, you have to remember, it's a province of 100 million people. It's huge. And, and it's viewed as the home of Confucian culture. And this, this ethic of public service arguably is more strongly held there. And just some little anecdotes that I mentioned in the book. In the rest of China, especially in the South, the lucky number is eight, because that's viewed as, a, as a, the number eight in Cantonese. It, it sounds like the same meaning as wealth. So in license plates and phone numbers, you'd want lots of number eights. That's true in most of China. In Shandong province, eight is not a lucky number. Actually, it's unlucky. The lucky number is seven, because there's a saying, um, Qi Shang Ba Xia, which means if you're a public official at the age of 57, you still have hope of being promoted. If you reach it at the age of 58, you're basically on the way down and, and un unlikely to be promoted. So in so on license plates and phone uh, phone numbers and in offices, if you had number seven, it would be viewed as very lucky. Um, only in Shandong province. And again, part because of this view that serving as a public official is, is a source of great pride and it's really viewed as the best form of life. Mm. And is, is Shandong's province, its pride of its Confucian heritage, is this, does it coincide with the sort of broader revival and reappreciation of Confucianism that has occurred in the last 10, 15 years in China? Or have they always, even throughout the 20th century, has there been a, a more appreciation for Confucius in Shandong province? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's, I think it's um, Shandong province is part of the trend where throughout most of the 20th century, Confucianism wasn't valued as much. Um, and in the Cultural Revolution, of course, it was directly attacked. But even then in Shandong province, so you have 300,000 people who have the same surname Kong, which in Chinese Confucius mm -hmm. is, means Confucius, right? Kongzi. And there's a family cemetery in Chufu, which is near Confucius' hometown, which is the oldest family cemetery in the world called Kongling. And for many descendants of Confucius, to be part of that family line is a great source of pride. 
Um, so even in Cultural Revolution, when, when confusion was being attacked, many descendants of Kong would, would secretly hold on to that tradition, burying their books about the tradition and, and waiting for things to blow over um, before they could resume this kind of pride. So arguably it has been and continues to be stronger, this attachment to the Confucian tradition in Shandong province than other parts of China, especially by descendants of Confucius. And I mentioned at my university, the, I was hired by the party secretary who himself was a 76th generation descendant of Confucius. His surname is Kong. And one of my great friends um, was, was hired by me um, was another descendant of Kong, also 76th generation descendant. So, uh, this, this, so that, that's part of the explanation for why in Shandong province it's and it's one of the great ironies of history because one of the one of the great achievements of, of Confucius himself is he challenged the meaning of what it means to be a Junzi or so before uh, Confucius to be Junzi was like a, a like an aristocrat who you would be superior because of your bloodline. He says no, he said to be a Junzi is because of your achievements and you because of your exemplary moral personality. Um, so. And not because of your bloodline, but ironically, it's the descendants of Confucius who carried his tradition in a very strong way compared to others and probably helps to explain the survival of this tradition as well. Yeah. Mm. Just for those of us who are not as au fait with uh, Confucianism and Chinese terms, perhaps you could explain to the listeners what a junza means. So, uh, so in much of the Confucian tradition, um, there's this idea that we should aspire to be a Junzi. So it requires a um, lifelong quest for self-improvement, and it only ends with your death. And self-improvement means improving your abilities, your, your, your judgments in new situations, and also improving your moral character. And those who can more or less successfully do that, at least better than others, are labeled Junzi. And again, that's, and that's in the Confucian sense. It means having above average ability and especially virtue. Whereas before Confucius, there was this term, Junzi, but it meant somebody who had, who was a kind of an aristocrat because of their bloodline, not because mm -hmm. of their virtue. Mm -hmm. So we might say that Confucianism views at least a, a part of, of the good life as, as a lifelong devotion to moral learning or, or moral yes, improvement. Yes, yes. And, 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 again, and again, the good life is that, and the best life involves serving the, the political community because the best way to, be, to do good in this world is to have the political power to do good. In other words, to serve as a public official. If, and if the times are right, you have a strong moral obligation to serve as a public official so that you can do the maximum amount of good in society. But if the times are not right, then you lay back, you know, and wait for things to improve. So it's not a saying you should blindly plunge yourself into politics mm -hmm. regardless of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And many of the, you know, Confucian uh, or oriented uh, scholars in the past, when there was the times were terrible, they just, you know, became poets and, and, and more, more, more influenced by the kind of Taoist ethic at that certain point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you observe that Chinese public officials have this huge capacity for hard work and that a lot of them are, you know, genuinely serving what they see as, as, as the common good um, of China and the Chinese people, which I suppose is very much contrary to how a lot of people would perceive one being a member of the Communist Party in China. There's this very negative stereotype. And that ties in with a question I wanted to ask you about your motivation for the book, because you write that one motivation is to counteract what you see as a demonization of China and China's political system, particularly in, in the Western media. You write how your, your interview requests from something like the BBC and the New York Times uh, have declined in correlation with you know, increasing competition uh, between the United States and China. Now you can't really say anything positive about China in, in the Western media. And I thought while reading that book, wow, uh, if he thinks that about the, the American media, he should see the Australian media. But anyway, um, I wanted to ask, what specifically do you think is being unfairly demonized about China's political system? Oh, I guess by demonization, I mean exclusive focus on what's bad about China. And of course, China, like every other society, especially large societies, have lots of terrible things 
and and uh, yeah, and I mentioned them in the book as, as well as so I try to be balanced. But there's also lots of good things going on. I mean, part the corruption drive has lots of problems, but I think it has been relatively successful at eradicating um, substantial amounts of corruption in the in the political system. Um, the huge environmental achievements, especially since the, uh, Xi Jinping assumed power, I mean, this radically transformed uh, much of China. Um, this efforts to reduce gaps between rich and poor and so on. Of course, it doesn't always work and it's counterproductive. Um, and just and at the ordinary level, uh, let, uh, let's just say this, you know, at the middle level of the bureaucracy, I mean, generally speaking, um, the, the public officials and bureaucrats that I dealt with are quite honorable people. I mean, during, for example, during COVID, they were really wholly committed to, um, to, 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 to implementing uh, the policies, some of which were misguided, especially at the end in 2022. Uh, but for two years, we had a pretty good run uh, in China um, uh, after the initial kind of, you know, whatever cover up in, in mm. Wuhan. I mean, uh, frankly, if the rest of the world had followed China's approach in those two years, we we wouldn't have had such a virulent form of COVID. And 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 it's all. But again, if once you start saying all this stuff, then immediately the alarm bells go off. Whoop! This guy's an apologist. We're not going to talk to him. Or you know, I'm I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not that much. Yeah. No, certainly not that much at all. Um, particularly not in the Australian context either. I mean one would think that we're about to be invaded by China, given the, <laughs> the, the level of media coverage. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, China hasn't gone to war since 1979. I mean, compare that to the other major power that's being discussed these days and how many wars that were launched that are not just unjust. You know, I, I mean, who's the bigger threat? I mean, it's not obvious, right, to me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly it's certainly not obvious. And it is ironic teaching international relations theory to, you know, first year university students and saying, well, um, you know, Kant thought that republics or constitutional democracies are the most peaceful form of government. But, you know, there's only one superpower today that hasn't gone to war in the last 40 years, and that's China. Right. I think you mentioned, you mentioned that sometimes, and I know you've said this elsewhere as well, that people unfairly characterize you as an apologist for China or the CCP or suggest that perhaps because you've lived and worked there for so long, you're somewhat brainwashed um, about, you know, and you're blind to, to the, to the horrors of the Chinese system. Um, but the critiques you make in the book, I think illustrate that that's not true, but I suspect that one of the reasons why this misunderstanding arises uh, is because you're a political theorist and one of the ways that political theorists often argue or present their ideas is in the form of an ideal. And that ideal can, you know, sometimes have a tenuous relationship with reality. I mean, an analogy is if you defend liberal democracy as an ideal, that doesn't defend, that doesn't uh, mean that you're always defending what the United States does, even if it is a liberal democracy. And I think this partly explains the problem because in a lot of your works, you defend the ideal of Confucian meritocracy and, and you argue that this political ideal is a better standard to judge Chinese political reform and progress rather than the standard of liberal democracy. So could you just explain what is Confucian meritocracy and why do you view it as an ideal that is better suited to uh, critiquing and evaluating Chinese political reform? Yeah, so um, in English when we hear the word meritocracy, often we mix up two things. One is um, the idea in how to distribute material goods. They should be distributed to the ones that have more achievements and that work harder. Um, that's not the Chinese ideal of meritocracy. Um, whether it's Confucianism or socialism, there's a, there's in, in China, the way that economic goods should be distributed, it doesn't depend so much on, on talent or, or, or on hard work. I mean, for for example, for Mencius, quite clearly, he said, it's only if people have basic material well-being that they have the capacity to be other regarding or to be moral. So therefore, the state has an obligation to provide basic material goods for people. Of course, that was also that's also part of the socialist tradition. And Mencius and many other Confucians also we have to pay attention to land distribution so that there's no huge gap between rich and poor, and so that there's a sense of harmony at the level of the village. So, so the, 
the the early Confucians, um, as well as throughout much of, of Chinese imperial history, were not kind of meritocratic in a sense that we think that resources should go to those who work harder and have more achievements or, or more natural talent. What they, and so in Chinese, it's political meritocracy. In Chinese, it's xian nang zheng zhi. And this is the idea that political power should be distributed to those who have superior ability and talent. And ability means, well, this capacity to work hard, um, and talent means this, this willingness to serve the people. Uh, sorry, virtue means um, this, this, this uh, willingness to serve the people. So that has been implemented through the diverse ways in Chinese history. I mean, the most famous and influential way is the imperial examination system, right? That we, once we select superior, which the best way to select public officials with above average ability and talent is through the examination system. But that was also criticized throughout much of imperial history. In the Song Dynasty, Zhu Xi says examinations are good for selecting those who have talent, but not so much for those who have virtue. So we need to look at other ways of selecting public officials. This discourse goes way back in Chinese history. It's not just Confucians, it's Mois, you know, in, in, uh, who, who had a similar view. Um, legalists, of course, I didn't pay much attention to virtue, but very much attention to ability. Um, so, and, and of course, in modern China as well, especially in the post-reform period, there's all these debates over how to select public officials with superior ability uh, and virtue and, and what are the best mechanisms of doing so and how to reduce the gap between the ideal uh, and the reality. That's really the central part of Chinese political culture, which has a long history and is still widely held as the ideal, the standard that we should use today to select and promote public officials. Um, and, and that if you really want to understand the Chinese political system, we have to understand the way this ideal informs a political system and the way that there's also still a huge gap to mention poor. And then there's all these debates over how to reduce that gap. Mm. So it's meritocracy in the sense that political power should go to those who are um, most hardworking, most other regarding, have the most virtue. Is that correct? Yes, yes. That. Uh, the political system should aim to select and promote public officials with superior ability and virtue. That's the ideal that informs the Chinese political system. And it's very hard to understand the Chinese political system without paying attention to that ideal. Now, why wouldn't a electoral system um, for the Chinese presidency or National People's Congress um, help deliver on that ideal? I mean, it's it still sort of seems like one can have that ideal with a mechanism, a selection mechanism, like electoral democracy? Well, electoral democracy, the point is to select whoever the people want to be selected. And if the people want to select somebody who has lower average intelligent virtue, then they can do so. That's fully com compatible with both the ideal and the practice of electoral democracy. But if you want to implement a political meritocracy, then you have to rely on other means. Um, it doesn't mean that elections are excluded, but elections wouldn't be would need to be modified. I mean, for example, uh, Sun Yat-sen, Sun Zhongshan, you know, who was regarded as a founding father, both by the communists and by the KMT in Taiwan. Um, he argued that, well, we can use elections, but um, they have to, those who are selected have to still go through an, an examination system before they assume power. So there, that's a meritocratic check on, on the system. Um, that if elections were to be used, there would have to be some sort of meritocratic check of that sort to ensure, or not to ensure, to increase the likelihood that uh, public officials, are, at least to, to reduce the likelihood that, that those who have lower ability and virtue would be selected. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I mean, just to, just to not push back, but to perhaps suggest, is this idea really so different from, say, if you read the Federalist Papers by James Madison or um, Aristotle's conception of, of rule by the best, right? Like Madison, the explicit design in the Federalist Papers is is wanting to avoid the problem that you identify of, of yeah. people in a democracy choosing people sure. who aren't virtuous. Good. So is the yeah. ideal so different? Excellent. Excellent. No. So there were meritocratic checks that the founding fathers tried to put in place, like the Electoral College initially was meant to be a check on those who could serve power. That it's not just whoever the people vote, 
would be selected. They'd have to go through an electoral college, which would be some sort of meritocratic check. But those checks have been completely downgraded now. I mean, now the electoral college is, in, is just whoever they they don't have, you know, the, in practice, they don't have the right to refuse uh, the, the, who the people select. So, yes, I mean, the founding fathers in the U.S., I mean, John Stuart Mill, 19th century, you know, he he also worried about uh, just leaving it up to the people that you have. So he had this idea that we should have extra voting rights for those who have university degrees. I mean, simplifying a little bit, but basically that's what it came down to. That, But the idea now of implementing meritocratic checks of that sort would, is viewed as completely out of, uh, you know, out of the realm of, of moral possibility and, and, and political feasibility. Something has happened since World War II that the idea of implementing meritocratic checks is, is viewed as, as almost off limits. And you know, no matter how bad the populism becomes, you know, the idea of implementing some meritocratic checks in the political system is, is impossible. Like I had, uh, there's, there's, one, there's, uh, there's one excellent, she turned out to be an excellent scholar called El, El, Elena Zilioti, who's, who's a professor now, has a very good book um, published by Oxford. Um, but she, when, when she was a PhD student in Singapore, we, we wrote a piece together where she argued that to have a, to select um, public officials and in, in the European Parliament, there should, people who vote should have to pass something that's like easier than a driving test, just 10 multiple choice questions about knowledge of two political parties, just to ensure that those who vote have minimal knowledge of what they're voting for. I mean, it's a beautiful idea, frankly, but it, it's complete, it would be viewed as, you know, just something that's just completely crazy. I mean, nobody, imagine running on a, on a political platform with that with that sort of uh, idea, I mean, people just laugh you out, out of court in Western society. Something happened. I don't know what. That's quite depressing, I think. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Um, it makes me think about how in Australia we have one of the few democracies that has compulsory voting. Um, but most people don't know the difference between the House of Representatives and the Senate. And I, I think, well, what are you doing? What what must they be thinking when they have two sheets of paper when they go to vote? I mean, it's it's one of the reasons why I've always resisted this idea of giving, which is a live debate actually in Australia, and I could see it happening within the next 10 years of lowering the voting age to 16. Um, and of course, there are many intelligent, well-informed 16-year-olds, but viewed from this meritocratic perspective, I can't really get on board with the idea of 16-year-olds voting. <laughs> Yeah, the pressure is all the other way. It's to have more, fewer restrictions rather than more, you know, but, and, and this is one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks to a, a tension in liberalism. I mean, you mentioned John Stuart Mill wanting sort of more votes for the educated. Liberalism, to simplify, obviously, regards individuals as fundamentally free and equal to one another, if not in capacities, but rather their normative status and deserving of respect. And so Mill advocates for this kind of um, individualistic society in which everyone's pursuing their own talents and developing their capabilities. But then he worries that rather than leading to this eccentric society where individual capacities are flourishing, the reverse actually might happen, where that we might get this kind of rever reversion to the lowest common denominator and actually people just follow the crowd. And similarly, Benjamin Constant makes an argument where um, because in contemporary liberal societies we have so much freedom, we might actually just decide to not practice virtue, not pay attention to politics and pursue commercial commercial interests. So liberalism identifies this tension that I think you're, you're speaking to here, but doesn't really have an answer to it. Sure. And in the 19th century, it was a stronger tension. I mean, Tocqueville is another we can label them democratic elitists, and 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 now it's it's you have a few who push these these ideas among West in Western political theory, like Jason Brennan is one, and Brian mm. Kaplan, um, but they're but it but they have zero practical uh, impact, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. So, do you view then political norms and political ideals as being, in a sense, like? cultural artifacts uh, we can't it doesn't we can't sort of sit back and talk about universal political norms that should guide development in the US and China and Australia like are they just sort of culturally grounded are they all contextual or, or do you see some norms as potentially being universal 
I think there's there is what Charles Taylor called an unforced consensus on some norms, or um, you know, or Michael Walter had also a similar idea of thin human rights. You know, don't don't kill people, don't torture people. Slavery is bad, genocide is bad. I mean, very few, except for like you know, hardcore terrorists would 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 disagree at the level of principle with those ideas. And I would want to add some some others that are more <clears throat> in the tradition of positive rights, like commitment to basic material well-being and, and the state has an obligation to reduce poverty. I mean, um, I think that there's not much of a need to argue at the level of principle about those, those norms. It's more a question of how to implement them um, and how to expose the bad guys, so to speak. But when it comes to other norms, like what's the best way of selecting and promoting political leaders, or what's the best way of distributing material goods, or to what extent should the state uh, provide for um, cultural activities and, and, and musical activities, and, and to what extent education should involve a form of um, you know, patriotic education. I mean, all these questions, I think, are, are, are much more culturally uh, embedded. Yeah. Mm, mm. And Confucianism has a kind of thick conception of the good life that can help answer those questions. Um, it's it's both thick, but it's also respectful of pluralism, right? Because one mm. of the central Confucian virtues, so to speak, is he, which is usually translated as harmony. And when the Beijing opening ceremony, the Olympics, sorry, the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics in 2008, um, had to select a character to represent the best of Chinese culture. This was the character that was selected. But in Chinese, it's a bit... It, 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 it's a bit misleading to translate as harmony in English. I mentioned I make that point in the book as well, because in Chinese, like literally every educated person, it's probably the most famous line from the Analects of Confucius, knows this line that he are butong, which means that, well, Junza, exemplary persons, should promote, let's translate it as diversity and harmony rather than tong, which we can translate as conformity or uniformity. Um, or and and so the idea here is that harmony involves, it's, it takes for granted diversity, even conflict. The question is how to harmonize it so that it reduces open conflict or to put it more positively, how to harmonize this diversity so something more beautiful emerges from an aesthetic point of view and from a moral point of view. Um, these are the big debates in the Confucian tradition. So, so any government that would be seriously promoted, seriously committed to Confucian ideals would be respectful and in fact would, would, would be committed to a loving, a form of pluralism and diversity that, it, that, 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 that promises to produce something quite beautiful and quite moral um, with that, with, while avo avoiding open or at least physical violence. Yeah. Fascinating. So, so you think that Confucianism entails then a, a normative commitment to respecting pluralism? Sure. Yes. I mean, very much so. I mean, that's not just my kind of weird interpretation. As yeah. I said, this value of, of is really central to the Confucian tradition. And, and Confucians have made lots of, uh, are using sometimes um, examples and, and to make this point. You know, for example, um, a, a soup is very bland if it only has salt. But if you add many spices, it becomes much more tasty. Or musical note, if it's single, Actually, in English, if we think of harmony, think of musical harmony, then it makes more sense to think of this Confucian idea of harmony. Very diverse and, 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 and complex, and so that something beautiful emerges out of that. It also has a moral meaning. If you, if you have different possibilities, then it, 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 it can allow for different forms of human flourishing. That's also part of the tradition. Um, and politically, it's very clear. It has a critical aspect, too, that if the ruler only listens to one view, among his or her advisors, it's this is a recipe for disaster. You have to have diverse views to expose what's wrong uh, and to criticize uh, the status quo. That's also a very central part of this critical Confucian tradition. And it's worth remembering mm -hmm. the early Confucians were failed political advisors. They were severe social critics who, who really were strongly uh, critical of the political system in their own day. That was true throughout much of uh, Chinese history. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, this reminds me of a of a part in the book where you uh, criticize President Xi for promoting a single conception of the good life, which is working hard for the common good, which you think is is applicable for uh, 
bureaucrats um, and public servants, but might not be applicable for other groups in society. And I, I interpreted this as you almost kind of defending a, like a liberal neutrality in, in, in that you think the state should not have a view on what the good life is, but perhaps that was me reading it um, too narrowly. Uh, Are you s using the idea well, of harmony actually to critique that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's something in between this idea. There's only one idea of the good life and the state should promote exclusively that notion versus a state should be neutral, not involved at all. And I think the, the Confucians don't mind if there's a kind of educational system that aims to make people more public spirited and that aims to select public officials with above average ability and virtue. But um, beyond that, and, and much should, the state shouldn't rely on force to get things done. I mean, for the Confucians, to use modern language, it's more relying on soft power to get things done. Education, moral persuasion, moral example, informal rituals to generate a sense of community among people. All these are with, with legal uh, punishment as a last resort, only when all those other mechanisms fail. I mean, that's typically the Confucian view. Um, but that said, I, I don't mean to say that the state should be exclusively Confucian. I mean, China has many other traditions, including Taoism, which are typically not viewed as, as you know, you have to be either Confucian or Taoist. I mean, it could be, in, as mentioned earlier, in different phases of life, you know, in your middle age, you work hard, you have lots of energy, then maybe it's a good time to be Confucian. But later on, when you're older, you have less energy, um, and maybe you're more interested in, in poetry and, and drinking and so on, then it's a good time to be a Taoist, you know, so... So, so the, the, the idea is, it's not to say that the state should promote only Confucianism, but even if it is limited to this Confucian view, then it would still be respectful of pluralism, but not to the extent of, of a liberal neutrality. I mean, that's really, or even within the liberal tradition, I mean, neutrality is a fairly, uh, uh, let's, let's say, modern invention, right? I mean, uh, for most, most of the liberals in, in, in tradition, we're not didn't advocate state neutrality. It's a relatively modern idea. By the way, if I can just have a little bit of a critique here of Alexandre Lefebvre's wonderful book, Liberalism's Way of Life, I, I think he should go further than that. I mean, I think he should argue that not only does he identify key virtues that make liberalism an important uh, way of life, but that the state through its educational system can promote those, those sorts of virtues. But he was surprisingly to me, he was against that. He's saying, no, I don't think the state should be perfectionist in any way. I find that I was a bit surprised that, that he would take that line. I would urge him to be a stronger, more committed, non-neutralist liberal. You know? mm, mm, yes, I agree. I think uh, perfectionist liberalism or comprehensive liberalism is, is more honest um, and more virtuous. And I, I think it is actually how many liberal societies do in fact operate. I mean, we're, there's a debate going on here at the moment about gambling, uh, banning gambling ads. Um, what is your issue with gambling? If you think that everyone can choose their own good life, I think a comprehensive liberal has a very honest answer to that as well. It's like, it strips you of your autonomy. It like robs you of the ability to make rational choices because it's designed to be addictive. You can have a sort of liberal comprehensive argument based on virtue, um, right. which we're doing anyway, but we're very coy about saying it. Yeah, and there might be also liberal arguments for limiting social media for children or whatever, based on those comprehensive grounds. But yeah, for example, yeah, to support what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, well, we've been in furious disagreement for this whole um, interview, so uh, mm -hmm. let's let's wrap it up with the the, the last chapter, which is called um, the case for symbolic leadership. Now, I think I understand your general point uh, that it's perhaps a good idea to separate the executive power from the symbolic power. And I think a country that does this quite well is, is Ireland. Um, they have a kind of symbolic president. Um, and you make a good point that if people feel symbolically attached to a president, then they're going to support them regardless of like their legislative failures. So fair enough. My issue, however, is that you seem to defend the British monarchy as being a sort of an appropriate um example of this symbolic leadership and maybe i'm wrong i mean correct me if i'm wrong but you you seem to imply that you are in the canadian context um a constitutional monarchist is that correct yeah i mean i again it's it's not something that as a kid i i, I was probably i would have been against it but the more i think about it both from a kind of um emotional point of view 
Um, and also just looking at what are the successful political systems, relatively successful in the world today, most of whom have a way of, of separating symbolic power from real political power. I mean, wh however you think about it, most people have, you know, politics is, is an emotional sport, so to speak. And, and if there's a, a symbolic figure that can capture the emotion, that can unify um, the political community uh, based on, on, on that sim symbolic tie, so that people can be more rational when it comes to evaluating the actual political, uh, those who hold actual political power, then I think that that generally works quite well. So there, there's a, but uh, so there, there's a there's a very good. I think I referred to him in my book as well. Um, there's there's a a legal scholar at University of, uh, of uh, Chicago who who shows you know that among the, the what are the political systems that score w well on most of the indices of. Uh, well-being tend to be uh, some some sort of constitutional monarchy. I mm. think in in Canada, it's and it's one of the reasons why perhaps there's less populism than in the U.S. Because again, if there's no not that symbolic figure to to for that can capture people's emotion, and people then are projected on the actual political power holder, like for example Donald Trump. But in Canada, there's less populism because there is this constitutional monarchy that could serve as as an outlet for people's emotions so to speak and i don't mean like i'm looking down at common people i have the same you know emotional need to identify with uh you know, with, with, with with a symbolic power holder so I, i'm not i'm not saying that this is something that you know and to use confucian terminology xiao ren or petty people would have what drinza wouldn't have that's not my view at all um so maybe but again it's probably contextual too i mean if in australia there's this very strong republican tradition and the british monarchy is too far removed, or it has this ugly history of oppressing minorities, or being racist, and so on. Then, then you know, who am I to uh, to, to pass a judgment on on, on that? But mm -hmm. of course, my chapter is mainly in the case of China, where I do worry that there's no separation of, of symbolic power and real political power, and that leads to that can be very dangerous. And that's the um, that that's that that's the critical force of that chapter, and frankly, also helps explain why the book um, is not allowed to be translated and published in mainland China. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but are, are there? I might be making this up, but is there a Confucian scholar who actually argues for the restoration of the um, royal line in China for kind of a similar reason that you're identifying here to have this sort of symbolic uh, figurehead in China? Yeah, yeah. His name is Yang Qing, and so his works have been translated um, in, in, in a um, book, I think it's called a Confucian Constitutional Order um, mm -hmm. that I helped to edit along with Fan Raping by Princeton University Press. So he, he develops that idea in, in much more depth than I do, yeah. And, and one of the great ironies is that is that scholars advocating for reform of China's political system along Confucian lines often have difficulties getting these things published in mainland China, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, Jiang Xing, his own works are uh, cannot most of them at least cannot be published in mainland China. He publishes them outside of China, but still they're often circulated and well known. His arguments are well known, mm. and often, I mean, his views are controversial, frankly, because it's not. He he. More recently, he defends some, to my mind, really ugly patriarchal ideas that uh, sure. that that kind of discredits many of his other ideas, which it shouldn't really. I mean, practice you should mm. separate them, but uh unfortunately yeah that, this is the current situation yeah mm, okay very interesting just to close off now that you're no longer the dean and you're sort of i don't want to say freed because that uh you know is perhaps imposing a western view of, of <laughs> serving others but you're you're freed from these administrative responsibilities um what what are you thinking about now in terms of your research interests and do you have any plans for future books or articles how are you using all this new research time well, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I mean, so it is literally freedom in the sense I have more time to read and write. So that's definitely a, a good thing from a scholarly perspective. And so and now I'm looking at, and it's one of the courses that I'm teaching in University of Hong Kong. It's called Talking About Politics um, and Why Ancient De Political Debates in China Matter Today. So I'm looking at the debates between Confucians and legalists and Maoists. Uh, and Taoists from the pre before China was unified in um, about 2,200 years ago and warring states period in spring and autumn 
periods um, and, and, and trying to look at how fascinating these debates were. They directly engage with each other and why those debates are, have a lasting political impact and why they're still relevant for thinking about how to, um, how to think about some contemporary challenges, like how to reduce corruption in government or how, whether a war can be morally just or to what extent a state should provide uh, should should support uh, music and culture, um, or to, or how should family lobby? Should people have the right to instant divorce, or should there be a waiting period? So these debates, um, I draw these debates. I draw on these debates. I put the thinkers in dialogue with each other to make it more accessible and entertaining, and have them argue about contemporary issues. So that's a that's a manuscript that I've recently completed, but I'm sure I'll have to revise it before it's published. That's one book. I also want to do a book eventually on what it means to be or to become Chinese, because it's a fascinating question. Throughout mm. most of Chinese history, it wasn't viewed as an ethnic or racial category. It was viewed as a more cultural category. And, and so there's a big debate now exactly what it means to be Chinese from a kind of, well, we can say, you know, what are the kind of, as a descriptive characteristic, what it means, what, what sort of, is it being committed to a certain view of history? Um, and what, or is it, what about from an ethical point of view? Does it mean to being committed to certain values? What about politically? What does it mean? What does it mean legally? These are fascinating issues. And I want to write, but it's a long-term project, a book on that question. Of course, of course. Well, they both sound fascinating. Um, perhaps we'll get you back on the podcast when, when they're published. And I look forward to talking about your uh, works when they're published <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, well, you've done, I highly commend um, your book, The Dean of Shandong, to anyone who wants to learn more about China in a critical but even-handed way. I think the, the main virtue of the book is that it combines, I think, the insights and rigor of a sort of more standard political theory text, but it is extremely readable. Um, you describe it as being lighthearted. So it's very fun and enjoyable to read, but at the same time, very, very rigorous. So I do commend it to people. Well, you're very generous, overly charitable, frankly. <laughs> and Canadians are supposed to be the ones who are polite. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you.